Introduction Toyota's 1.4 litre diesel engine, commonly known as the 1ND TV engine, underwent some major design changes in November 2008. As this engine is used in the Auris, Corolla, IQ, Urban Cruiser, Yaris or Verso S, customers might since then complain of two issues. An increased engine oil consumption that requires topping up the oil level in between services or if the engine is equipped with a diesel particulate filter the oil level warning light might come on. This TSB explains the inspection and repair procedure to rectify the customer's problem. Fixing the problem once and for all is key to restoring the confidence of our customers. In this short video, we will be explaining how to use this TSB and what are the main points for your attention during inspection and repair? Background information. First of all, some background information. Oil consumption can be caused by three different components. Via the turbocharger shaft seal, through a defective vacuum pump or insufficient tension of the piston rings. To ensure that we fix everything in one go, we'll make sure that the turbocharger and vacuum pump have the latest countermeasures. Also, we will replace the short block with a reman short block that has the latest piston rings installed. An increase in oil level can occur when the DPF regeneration process is too often not completed. This can happen when the customer is mainly driving in city traffic at low speed. This new style TSB contains some hyperlinks that will take you directly to the detailed information. For that reason, it's best to consult and follow the TSB on a laptop or computer during the complete repair process. TSB Workflow Let's have a look at how it works. As an example, we have a customer with a Verso S with a 1ND engine meeting the Euro 4 level with a DPF. The complaint is oil consumption. This takes us to flowchart 2. The customer complained about oil consumption. So, we verify the consumption and write down the figure on the repair order. This is explained in Step A after we click inside the box. Step A explains how to check the oil level. We'll need this figure later when we complete the return document that we send back with the old short block. When this step is completed, we click on the Flowchart 2 hyperlink to return to our flowchart. Adjusting the oil level. The next step is to adjust the engine oil level. We have to regenerate the diesel particulate filter later and we certainly don't want to ruin the engine due to a lack of oil. Identifying parts that need replacement. 
we continue by verifying whether the turbocharger and vacuum pump meet the latest standard. To be able to read the identification on the turbocharger, it's best to remove the battery. Step C and D explain how you can identify the components. Note that we don't start to replace those parts at once. The flow charts are made in such a way that we first carry out all the inspections to identify the parts needed and then we perform the repairs. Inspecting the EGR. The next step is the inspection of the EGR system and the injectors. When the engine has been consuming oil for a certain mileage, there is a risk that EGR or injectors may have suffered. Here too, follow the flow chart. Don't forget to take a snapshot during the active test of the EGR valve, as well as the injector feedback values. These snapshots are needed to complete the warranty claim in case you need to replace those parts. Also here we will replace the parts when we start to reassemble the engine again after replacing the short block. Inspecting the intercooler. The next step is inspecting the intercooler. Oil leakage from the turbocharger might have accumulated in the bottom part of the intercooler. So, remove the lower tube on the intercooler and drain the oil, if any. Reflashing the ECU. Now we need to reflash the ECU. You'll find the procedure under step N in our flowchart 2. You are certainly familiar with this procedure, but if in doubt, consult the related TSB. It's essential not to forget to connect a battery charger during the reflash process. And to write down the original installed software version on your job card before you start the reflash. You'll need the software version number when you inspect the DPF later. Wait a few minutes for the reprogramming to be complete. The new software will make the next step easier because it also simplifies the way to erase a possible DTC P252F without having to make a test drive. To clear the DTC with the trip meter reset knob, follow step U in the TSB. Inspecting the DPF. Now we'll inspect the diesel particulate filter. The burnt oil in the engine 
might have left more ash in the DPF than normal, and this might lead to an early failure of the DPF. The engine ECU can judge this ash loading by measuring the resistance of the exhaust gases in the DPF. But first we have to burn off all remaining soot by carrying out a forced regeneration. Only when the regeneration is completed can we measure the pressure drop, also called the differential pressure, over the DPF. This differential pressure gives an indication of the ash quantity in the DPF. But do you know how a diesel particulate filter regenerates itself? When the ECU judges that the pressure drop over the DPF system has become too high, it will bring the DPF to a temperature of 580 degrees centigrade or more so that the soot particles can burn completely. How is this done? When there is sufficient heat produced by the engine, for example while driving at a speed of 60 km per hour, the ECU will begin an extra fuel injection. An extra amount of diesel fuel is injected after the main injection. This fuel, together with the large surplus of oxygen in the exhaust gases, will not burn in the combustion chamber but will be burnt in the oxidation catalyst, which is installed just before the DPF. This further increases the temperature of the exhaust gases. When those exhaust gases reach a temperature of 580 degrees centigrade, the soot in the DPF will be burnt as well. Activating forced regeneration. We can activate this forced regeneration through an active test on the IT2 or TechStream. You can find this behind the Active Test tab as Activate the DPF Rejuvenate command. After activation, drive as much as possible at a speed of 60 km per hour or more for at least 35 minutes. To avoid your having to manipulate the intelligent tester or TechStream computer while driving, or needing a colleague to do this, we record all required engine parameters in a snapshot and analyze those parameters after the regeneration drive. So, before we take the car out on the road, we need to set up the snapshot recording in the following way. Connect your IT2 or TechStream and let the engine idle. Select Powertrain, Engine and ECT and then Active Test. Select Activate the DPF Rejuvenate and then press Enter. Please remember that you cannot regenerate when there is a DTC in the memory. In that case, first take note of it and clear all DTCs. Then press the right pointing arrow and check if the display changes from off to on. Now open the function menu and select Snapshot Configuration. On this screen, select the following items. Set record time to 5 minutes. This is the maximum for the Intelligent Tester tool. Slide the trigger point almost completely to the end at 99%, not 100%. And choose to trigger on Parameter. Close this window by pressing the Trigger Configuration button. Now select Engine Runtime and DPNR, DPF Status Rejuvenation from the data list and press the right arrow. Then press OK. 
Now select the following items. Move the engine run time slider to the left to select 2100 seconds. Record quantity 1. Slide the slider for DPNR DPF status completely to the left, denoting completed. Verify that the OR function is highlighted. Click Exit. Our tester is now set up to make a 5-minute snapshot. Starting 5 minutes before the regeneration is hopefully completed or 2100 seconds, which is 35 minutes. Drive the car to an open road. Press the record button and start driving. Once our test drive is completed and we've stopped the car in a safe place, we can start to analyze our recording. Drive the vehicle where you can maintain a constant speed between 60 and 120 kilometers per hour. Depending on the exhaust gas temperature, the time to regenerate the DPF completely can vary, but it will never exceed 35 minutes. So, stop the car at a safe place after driving approximately 35 minutes. And then, have a look if the regeneration has been completed. If the status indicates operate, the regeneration has started but is not completed because you stopped the car too early. If the status displays completed or ready, return to the workshop for further analysis of the data. Take the IT2 and the service bulletin so that you can compare the measured differential pressure with what is allowed as a maximum. In production, two different computer logics were used. One that takes the vehicle mileage into consideration and another that does not. Therefore, check which was the original CID file that was installed in the engine ECU before you reflashed the ECU. You wrote the software number down on your job card. If you can find the CID number in the CID table, then you must compare the MAF value to the DPF table 1. If you cannot find the CID number in the CID table, then compare it to the DPF Table 2. On our vehicle, we cannot find the CID number in the CID table, so we'll use the DPF Table 2. We now open the snapshot on our IT2 or TechStream. Select the snapshot and click the play button. To judge the DPF, we have to look for stable engine conditions during the test drive made earlier on. To do so, select from the View menu, Line Graph 1. Click on the drop-down button of the second parameter and select MAF from the Parameter Selection list. And for the lowest parameter, select DPF Differential Pressure. Select 2 seconds per div by clicking on the timescale indication. We now have 12 seconds worth of data in one view. Play the snapshot while monitoring the MAF signal. If this is stable over the whole screen, pause the playback by pressing the pause button. Our vehicle has done less than 50,000 kilometers, so we look into column 1. In this case, the actual DPF value is lower than the value mentioned in Table 2, so our DPF is alright. In the event the regeneration is not completed, 
we need to find out first why the regeneration failed. It might be that the DPF is defective, but it can also be the catalytic converter that cannot raise the temperature of the exhaust gases high enough to burn off the soot. We can easily check by observing our snapshot recording. Select parameter Exhaust Temperature Bank 1 Sensor 2 from the data list and scroll through the recording. If the temperature exceeds 580 degrees centigrade, the catalytic converter is working correctly, so the DPF needs to be replaced. In the event the temperature hasn't reached 580 degrees centigrade, the catalytic converter is defective and needs to be replaced first before we can try another regeneration. Be careful. You cannot start another regeneration unless the engine has been running for at least 60 minutes. This is a safety feature that is built in into the engine ECU logic. When a forced regeneration is not completed, there is a risk that the post-injected fuel has not left the engine through the exhaust system, but has accumulated with the engine oil. By having the engine running for one hour, we are sure that all fuel that was mixed with the engine oil evaporated, passed through the PVC system to the intake and was burnt during combustion. Handling the Reman short block. By identifying all the parts that needed to be replaced, which we did during the replacement of the short block by Reman short block, in this way we have optimized the repair process. Return the old short block to your part center in the best possible condition so that a maximum of parts can be reused in the remanufacturing process. Never disassemble pistons or the crankshaft. Check that the water jacket spacer was removed, as it is to be reused with the new reman short block. And remove all coolant from the cylinder bore and from the water jacket. Use paper or shop cloth to dry off the short block. In any event, do not use a high pressure cleaner, washing machine or parts cleaner to clean the short block. Protect the short block against corrosion by spraying some conservation oil like Toyota Genuine Multipurpose Spray into the cylinder ball. Turn the camshaft so all cylinders can be reached. Close the plastic bag properly so that no water can enter and don't put any parts in the crate. You don't need to return the old cylinder head gasket. And insert the completed oil consumption check sheet that came with the reman part. Once the engine ECU has been reflashed, insert the supplement into the owner's manual and then explain the functions of the glow plug indicator or the DPF warning lamp personally to the customer. 